Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, September 6th, 2024. Let's get into it. First part of the video here is I wanted to get into uh, how the Democrats, uh, they, it's, it's great when they say the quiet part out loud. We knew that them bringing 12 million illegal immigrants, by the way, they're flying them in now. All right, so when Kamala says she, she wants to build some wall, a wall don't do no damn good if you're going to fly them in. And they're flying them in from all over the world to all sorts of different black uh, ops airports all around the United States. So now we know Chuck Schumer says the quiet part out loud that the whole point is to give them a path to citizenship. The only way we're going to have a great future in America is if we welcome and embrace immigrants, the dreamers and all of them, because our ultimate goal is to help the dreamers, but get a path to citizenship for all 11 million or however many undocumented there are here. All right, so that was Chuck Schumer. So then I was kind of fishing around because I was looking for videos on the, the, the RT topic. We're going to get into all of that next in the video, the Putin uh, video here in, in just a minute or two. Here's uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer again together saying the quiet part out loud that they're trying to legalize all the illegal immigrants. The only way we're going to have a great future in America is if we welcome and embrace immigrants, the dreamers and all of them, because our ultimate goal is to help the dreamers, but get a path to citizenship for all 11 million or however many undocumented there are here. Well, it's something we have to do for people for who are here now. Hmm? This is before your citizen. This is undocumented. Hmm? This is for the undocumented. Well, what I would like to do is move them to documented. They said that we can move them to documented. And one of the best things that we can do for our economy is to pass comprehensive immigration reform. All right, so right out of the horse's mouth, man. Remember when Chuck Schumer said, you know, that the three-letter agencies will get you six ways to Sunday when Trump was trying to go after the deep state? <laughs> Boy, was he right, wasn't he? Oh, my God, which brings me into the next topic. We got the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. Come back. I mean, it's like, it's like unbelievable. Uh, the, the, the gullible, uh, vacuous Democrats are going to believe all this stupid stuff. And even, even after it's been done, I mean, good Lord, we started back in 2016 on this theme. Here's uh, Merrick Garland talking about the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. The company never disclosed to the influencers or to their millions of followers its ties to RT and the Russian government. Instead, the defendants and the company claimed that the company was sponsored by a private investor. But that private investor was a fictitious persona. Can you believe that? That is insane, man. That is just insane. And then if you don't believe that they're going, that the media, the mainstream media is going along with this theme, here's MSDNC on Russian disinformation. And by the way, before I get into the video, where's the Russian disinformation coming from? I want you to go out there somewhere in, 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 in your neighborhood next time you're playing golf or whatever. Say, does anybody, I guarantee you they haven't even heard of RT. Russian television, okay? But ask them, say, is, does anybody here ever seen RT? And they're, they're going to say, no, but RT is banned. You can't even get the app off of the App Store or the Google Play Store. You can't put it on your TV. So, I mean, so for them to say that we're getting Russian disinformation from where? Well, you know, we'll get into that. I mean, the Garland video kind of gives you a hint of what's coming. But here's MSDNC. Breaking news, the Biden administration taking a series of actions to target what they allege are attempts by Russian-backed actors to manipulate public opinion here in the U.S. ahead of the presidential election, according to two senior U.S. officials. Joining us now is NBC's Ken Delanian. Ken, what more have we learned? Jose, this is being described by our sources as a whole-of-government action designed to target 
Russian propaganda and disinformation aimed at interfering in the 2024 election. It is said to include sanctions by the Treasury Department, law enforcement action by the Justice Department, and one of the focuses is on RT, formerly known as Russia Today, that network of Russian government-funded English-language websites and television platforms that was flagged all the way back in 2017 by the U.S. intelligence community as a vehicle for Russian disinformation and election interference. And at that time, the Justice Department required RT to register as a foreign agent. Uh, it remains to be seen exactly what actions the U.S. will take against RT today, but this does appear to represent an escalation in the efforts to try to purge the system of Russian propaganda and disinformation. What's interesting is that, look, the U.S. has been saying all along that not only Russia, but Iran and China, but particularly Russia, has been consistently trying to manipulate American public opinion with uh, disinformation on social media platforms, use of fake accounts, um, and, and through RT, through its state-sponsored <laughs> platforms um, as they did in 2016. The difference now is that there are mechanisms in place, particularly on social media platforms, to try to stop uh, and flag fake accounts before the influence operations spread too widely. So it remains to be seen what impact this Russian disinformation is having. But nonetheless, this is a stance by the Biden administration to say, if you're violating U.S. laws and policies, we're going to come after you. Uh, and Attorney General Merrick Garland is expected to chair a meeting of the government's election task force today, this afternoon, with FBI Director Chris Wray and other officials, and he may have public comments to make about this effort at that time. That's it. All right, so, so they're getting back into all of that, and you know that's going to get parroted on every single mainstream media station. So here's the, the, the rest of the story, because uh, we watched the Garland video. So what he was saying was this, this company, T-Net, T-E-N-E-T, -E -E by the way, if you want to follow them on um, Twitter. They're at, uh, at watch T-E-N-E-T -E -E now. Uh, I don't know, maybe since the, um, the FBI is after them, it might not be, <laughs> be a good time to follow them. But I wanted to go over there just to see what the hell they were saying about all of this, but uh, I didn't go. Uh, I, I, I get myself in enough trouble. So, uh, but anyway, as a result of this, this whole trolling thing about... Uh, RT or Russian disinformation, they gobbled up some of the uh, right wing, they call them right wing influencers, but they're really your conservative uh, uh, podcasts or influencers. Uh, you got Tim Pool involved in this, you got Benny Johnson, and I think Dave Rubin. Uh, and they're, they're saying that, and, and by the way, so here's, here, so there was a post. So Tim Pool basically, I, you know, he was trying to be nice about it. He says, look, man, I, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You know, you know, maybe my organization might have taken some money from this T-Net or, you know, we don't know. Uh, and he put up this post uh, that I'm showing you on the screen right now uh, that, you know, he's going to be nice to the FBI. But then DC Dranko came out and he's like, oh, hell no. If you're an influencer and the FBI knocks on your door and I, I'm putting that post up right now. OK, now he says, you know. Do not speak to the FBI. I mean, or, or say as he said, I think he said, say as little as possible at first. And then he said, uh, look, man, if the FBI ever knocks on your door, you don't say a word to them. Scott Ritter made a huge mistake when the FBI came and he cooperated with them and everything. He should have just said, well, he did ask, show, you could say something like, show me your warrant. Right. You know, but certainly don't answer any questions that they give you. All right. Say, no, I'm not answering any questions without a lawyer present or saying anything. Now, you might also object, you know, when they're carrying your couch out of the house for no damn reason because they're stealing it. You might object to that and say, hey, man, what's a couch got to do with what, you know, what your warrant said? Right. So anyway, so I don't know. I, 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 but I, Tim Pool took the advice and then he posted uh, a post saying that um, that Ukraine is our greatest ally. <laughs> We should give them 200 billion. I got that post up right now. We should give them 200 billion more dollars. I mean, he's troll, obviously trolling the three-letter agency, in my opinion, you know. And uh, but I mean, what the hell? What the hell? I can't believe we're back in that. So this is all censorship. And uh, by the way, I I, um, I forgot to say, I, Elon Musk also said that if we legalize all these illegal immigrants, that the Democrats will win in perpetuity. 
The Republicans will never, ever win an election again. And that's why I don't understand why even the, the swampy Republicans should be fighting against the legalization of immigrants. But anyway, I guess they're really just Republican. I mean, uh, Democrats. I mean, when you think about it, what is it? The Bushes and the McCains and the Romneys all came out in support of Kamala Harris. Or I've seen some ex posts on that. And I, I haven't verified that. I've just read a couple of posts that said that that's what they're going to do. So we knew, we always knew they were Democrats. We called them rhinos, but now we know that they really were Democrats in, in Republican uh, clothing, wolf in sheep's clothing, right? That's what they were. They were Democrats in Republican clothing. So now we know that. So now we get into the the next big story that was uh, uh, on the Internet. And I think I already told you about, our, uh, yeah, we talked about RT being banned everywhere because nobody can watch it. So what the hell? Let's hit the, uh, uh, the, the videos on RT first. So here is the uh, communist. Here's a communist. I didn't even know we had communists in the United States other than the Democrats. But this is an actual proclaimed communist of the Communist Party in the United States. Let's watch. I've never thought I'd agree with a communist. Let's watch that video first. Cross now to academic Christopher Halali, International Secretary of the American Communist Party. Christopher, great to have you on the program with us. So here we have another wave of accusations against RT coming from Washington. I want to say it's entirely predictable. Uh, but what are your thoughts on this? What's your take on the election interference allegations? Of course, uh, it's a first as tragedy, then as farce. But this has become all too common uh, and too farcical at this point. Uh, this is the third election cycle that we are experiencing uh, the quote-unquote uh, uh, hysteria over Russia's supposed involvement in our elections. Uh, and of course, it mirrors history uh, as a U.S. history teacher and student myself. Of course, uh, we remember all of these uh, uh, slogans and uh, ideas from the Cold War. Nothing's really changed. Uh, I mean, maybe a drunk man in the Kremlin would be the ideal for the Americans, but at this point with a strong leader and with Russia pursuing a new international order and path outside of the Western uh, hegemony, outside of uh, the Western control. Uh, therefore, everything uh, is, uh, is a Russian uh, disinformation. There are Russians hiding everywhere, under the bed, in the closet. I really think that this, of course, is uh, simply an opportunity for the, uh, the, the, the Justice Department under President Biden to uh, deflect on all of the ongoing uh, ills within American society, uh, to deflect from Kamala Harris's actual positions and program, uh, or Donald Trump's uh, ongoing uh, issues with his campaign and litigation, and to really lay blame not only to Russia, Russia is but one. They're also uh, condemning Iran, they're condemning China, so that all of these countries in this new multipolar order, uh, they're all responsible for America's decline. But of course, the U.S. government doesn't look in the mirror for all the times that it lied, whether it be in Iraq or going into Libya or uh, dismembering Serbia and separating Kosovo. Uh, there are so many instances where the real disinformation was done from the American side. But of course, that was just spreading democracy and human rights. All right. So that was a communist on on the uh, on RT and, and the whole Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. So then I got into another video by Larry Johnson, and he's talking at RT. Now, the reason he can do that is he takes no money from RT. Uh, he's just a contributor. Now, I don't know how he gets up there. I guess he's got his own VPN, and that's why they haven't gone after him, because he doesn't make any money. So as long as you're not making any money, they can't come after you. So this is Larry Johnson, the first video where he's talking about... Uh, the whole uh, Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. All right, let's cross now to Larry Johnson, a former CIA analyst. Uh, Larry, good to have you on the program with us. Another wave of accusations against RT coming from Washington. What's your take on, on this whole election interference claims? Do you remember the old Saturday Night Live skit with Christopher Walken, where they were doing a blue oyster cult, <laughs> and Walken kept coming out saying, more cowbell. <laughs> more cowbell. Yep, yep. This is more. This is more cowbell. Okay, so let let's start with the facts. Fact number one: the country in the world that has engaged with more meddling and political interference in the affairs of other countries is the United States. Number one. 
during the reign of Dwight David Eisenhower, president of the 1950s. He was responsible for over 148 covert actions, in, or 178, in 48 different countries, which included the overthrow of the governments of Iran and, and the governments uh, of Guatemala. Then let's jump ahead to 2016. It actually started in December of 2015, where Brent Podolsky, a Democrat operative, was emailing with John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, about how they were going to create, fabricate, this relationship between Trump and Putin as, a, as an attack tool. They not only used, it was Hillary Clinton's campaign that led it, but they had the full cooperation of the CIA, full cooperation of the FBI, full cooperation of much of the media. It was an entirely fabricated, and yet it was done not by Russia, it was done by Americans, by Hillary Clinton and her uh, gang. Mm. So right off the bat, what you get, what you have going on here today is Merrick Garland's picking up uh, where Hillary Clinton left off. The, the, the concept that RT, who is not allowed to broadcast in the United States, at least you can't get it on your cable news. I do have it on my Apple TV because I had it from six, seven years ago, but they've taken it off now. You can't get the app on Apple TV. You do have to try to watch it online, maybe with a VPN. But how is it that RT, who has barely got a presence in the United States and has one of the smallest our, you know, social media platforms as far as Americans going to it, is somehow this powerful entity that's able to direct and interfere, quote, interfere in the presidential election? The only interference that's going on right now is the Biden administration is allowing millions of illegal immigrants to come to this country to register to vote so that you will have foreigners voting in what should be an American election. So this is an outrage what is being visited upon Russian entities. It's just, but it's, it, this is one more example of the decline of the West. It's a descent into what I call Stalinist tactics. Mm -hmm. This is reminiscent of Joe Stalin during the, the old bad old days of the Soviet Union. Except it's not the Russians doing it. It's the French. It's the Brits. It's the Americans. And it's now also the Brazilians cracking down. They're trying to crush any opposition voices, and it's a danger. All right, so then I was kind of, you know, I had that first part, and then Larry Johnson continued on later on in the video after they did a couple of questions. You know, they always have to have some puff in there, like, you know, what do you think the future holds, Larry Johnson? But anyway, this was the second part of the video I wanted you to watch because he's got some good points here. Um, and what's really shocking about this is, look, I've, I've had media experience going back 30 years, going back to 1994. Uh, my first gig was I was invited onto CNN to talk about the capture of Carlos the Jackal in Sudan. And I did a pretty good job. I, you know, I gave good sound bite. And, and, and I ended up doing every single major uh, media outlet in the United States, both uh, cable news and broadcast news, ABC, CBS, NBC, all of them. I was on ABC Nightline. CNN Crossfire, I did BBC, I did Canadian Broadcast, CBC. What I discovered was most of those stations, almost always, would do a pre-interview. They wanted to find out what I had to say beforehand. And then, depending on the answers I gave, they'd make us, oh, we decided to go a different direction. Oh, we decided not to have you. Because they didn't like to hear what I had to say. The only There's only been two television stations that I've been on they never did a pre-interview. One is RT. RT has now, and I've been, I've been making RT appearances maybe for seven, eight years. Uh, go, well, it started in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, at no time was I ever, did you guys ever do a pre-interview to try to say, hey, what are you going to say? And at the same time, I've never been paid by you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is Press TV in Iran. So think of the irony of this. It's the Russian, it's RT, and it's the Iranians who don't ask these uh, questions in advance to try to figure out what kind of propaganda they want to put out. All right, so that was Larry Johnson. So now we're going to get into the Putin troll video, or it's a lot of, so what a lot of people are calling it. I'm going to tell you right now, I, did, I kind of thought that Putin was trolling too. 
you know, and I, I figured Putin would be for Trump more so than, than Kamala. That's not true, man. The man is a man of his word. And Scott Ritter keeps pointing out, you just got to listen to what he says and take it, I mean, at full face value. And I wasn't going to do that, and we're going to get into it, but let's watch the Putin troll video. Ну, я же говорил, у нас, значит, фаворитом, если можно так сказать, был действующий президент, господин Байден. Ну, вот он, его сняли из гонки, но он рекомендовал всем своим, значит, сторонникам поддержать госпожу Харрис. Ну, вот и мы тоже так сделаем, будем ее поддерживать. Это, во-первых, а во-вторых... Она... Раззавещали, значит, надо, да? Во-вторых, она так выразительно и заразительно смеется, что, что это говорит о том, что у нее все хорошо. If we can name a favorite candidate, it, it was, it used to be Joe Biden, but now he is not participating in the election campaign, and he recommended to all his allies to um, support uh, Ms. Harris, so that is what we are going to do. So it was, well, he said that we should, that is why we should also do that. Well, she, her laugh, uh, she, she's laughing, so, her laugh is so fascinating, it means that uh, everything is good, and every, if everything is good. It means that, um, for instance, if we're speaking about Joe Biden, there are so many sanctions against Russia uh, introduced, and if, if and if everything is good with uh, Miss Harris, maybe she will refrain herself from such measures, or maybe she'll change them. So in the end, uh, it will be the choice of the U.S. people, and we will respect this choice. All right. So there was that. Like two of them. I showed them back to back. So now we get into Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he's got a guest host on the show right now, maybe because uh, um, everything's been banned or shut down or censored down in Brazil. Either that or he just has a guest host. And this guy, he had a lot of technical difficulties. So I always want to tell you whenever I edit a video the, that I've edit, I had to heavily edit this video because they, there were pauses in it. The guy, uh, he would sit there and go, um, blah, 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 let's try to bring that up. Oh, you couldn't bring it up? Nope. Okay, well, uh, let, we'll get back to that later on in the video. You know, so anyway, I cut all that stuff out. So you're going to see it kind of chopping around because, I, I, I mean, it really made it kind of, it was t tough for me to sit there and watch through it. But luckily, you'll be able to see it without any pauses in the video. And plus, sometimes he went off on tangents that I didn't think was relevant to the topic that I was trying to show. Let's watch this. It's kind of a long video. But I think it's worth it. He was in Vladivostok. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's in the far east of Russia today for some sort of economic forum. And he spoke at length, uh, a great length, actually. And he took a question from the press uh, who were assembled on the U.S. election. And he's usually had some consistent themes in the manner in which that he's commented on the election. But... Uh, today was interesting and notable, so let's pull up the transcript of what Putin said today. Okay, so here's what Putin said. I'll just read it aloud since we are having trouble with the graphics here, but that's no problem. Uh, he says, um, as for favorites, so some of the reporters asked him, in the topic of the election race in the United States, you said before that you had your favorite in it, but he dropped out of the race. And the reporters, they're referring to Biden. Who is the new one? And in November, when the results of this race are known, will you call to congratulate the new head of state or not? Okay, so here's what Putin said. As for favorites, it is not for us to determine that. It is the, it is the choice of the American people. So that's sort of like a stock answer. But then he goes on to say, I have always said, already said our favorite, if I may so, say so, was the incumbent president, Mr. Biden. He was dropped from the race. So note the phrasing there. He's not saying that Biden dropped out on his own volition, which obviously did not happen. He's saying Biden was dropped as if it was something that was imposed upon him, which is accurate. He was dropped from the race, Putin said, but he recommended that all of his supporters support Ms. Harris. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to support her. That's first of all. Putin continues, she laughs so expressively and contagiously that it shows she is doing well. 
Now, that seemed like a bit of a tongue-in-cheek remark on Putin's part, right? Of course, he's not genuinely enthralled by Kamala Harris's contagious laugh, I wouldn't think. You might even call it a cackle, but that could get into some sort of misogynist or sexist territory, but I shouldn't have even gone there. It seems like he's making a bit of a wisecrack, right? She goes on to say that, uh, Putin goes on to say, and if she's doing well then, Trump has imposed so many restrictions and sanctions on Russia that no president has ever imposed before. And if Ms. Harris is doing well, then maybe she will refrain from such actions. So taking him on a surface level, Putin is saying that he maybe has some faint hope that Kamala Harris, because she's so joyous and so carefree and so compelling in her demeanor, maybe she will see to it that she will rescind or refrain from imposing some of these sanctions that Trump had imposed when he was in office. This despite the common and still enduring perception that will never go away, that Trump is some sort of pawn of Putin or was collusively interfacing with him in some way, despite Trump's entire record as president really starkly contradicting that very stupid caricature. And Putin himself has noted this on many occasions. Trump imposed heavy, extreme, even according to Putin, unprecedented sanctions on Russia. And that's not wrong. That can be looked up in the public record. And so let's go through a number of previous instances of Putin commenting about his preference or lack thereof in the U.S. presidential election. Back in June, and we're going to see if we can get the, that he would prefer Biden. And Putin actually chastises people who didn't take it seriously when he said that his preference was for Biden. Putin said, quote, everyone took my statement about Mr. Biden with sneers and saw it as some sort of hidden attack on President Biden. Indeed, he is a politician of the old school. And what he did not like, he then, to a certain extent, began attack me to attack me. That's what I thought would happen. So I'm right. He is predictable. So then Putin's contrasting that with Trump, who he regards as less predictable, and saying that he was, would prefer the predictability and the traditional political nature of Joe Biden. And now he's saying that Kamala Harris has inherited that mantle that was handed down to her by Biden. And so he continues to have a preference for the Democratic nominee. Now, you have lots of people insisting that this cannot be a truthful statement on Putin's part and can't possibly reflect his genuine opinion because one of the most unshakable articles of faith in the anti-Trump liberal media is that Trump is in hock to Russia and that Putin obviously favors Trump and would even intervene or interfere in U.S. politics to install Trump into power. And yet, Putin is saying very clearly that he does not favor Trump because, among, for among other reasons, Trump imposed a huge amount of sanctions on Russia and was is also unpredictable in a way that Putin does not find amenable to Russia's interests. And this really does make sense because, if you recall, Trump ran in 2016 on a pledge that he would improve relations with Russia. He would always say stuff like, can't we just get along with Russia? Wouldn't it be nice if we all got along with Russia? Yeah, but Trump, you know, we had a clip of one of the many times that Trump in the 2016 campaign said, wouldn't it be nice if we just could all get along with, and that Russia and the U.S. could have a positive relationship? And what happened? U.S.-Russia relations cratered. Here, there, there we go. That they were making 18 years ago. They're not talking about that. People are tired. We're fighting. We don't get along with anybody. And yet they rip. We don't get along with China. But they rip us off. We don't get along with Russia. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia? Wouldn't it be nice? I mean, is there something wrong? But yeah, so there's Trump repeating what had been one of his most common refrains in 2016, that he wanted to improve relations with Russia. And then he didn't do it. So... Of course, Putin, it's rel relatively sensible for him to observe what actually occurred under Trump's administration. Note that Trump's rhetoric did not match up with his actions in terms of forging some sort of detente with Russia and then make a prognosis 
based on that information for the 2024 election. Not that he likes Kamala Harris, right? Kamala Harris is just as zealous, as far as anybody can tell, in terms of arming Ukraine and bashing Russia as this great tyrannical foe as Joe Biden has been. But Putin seems to be suggesting that because the Democratic nominee is more predictable in the ire that they're projecting out against Russia, that to them is pre- that to Putin is preferable than this sort of chaotic mishmash of words and deeds that he's come to expect possibly with Trump. And so that's the point that Putin made today, just as he has many other times, although there have been instances when Putin said stuff to the effect of, it doesn't really matter who gets elected president. So here's what Putin said almost a year ago, September 12th, 2023. Quote, I find it difficult to say what to expect from a new president, whoever it may be. It is unlikely, though, that any crucial change will take place because the current authorities have conditioned American society to be anti-Russia in nature and spirit. That is how things are. They did this, and it will now be very difficult for them to turn that ship around. And, you know, Putin has added to that on many occasions that Trump imposed those extreme sanctions that lacked some degree of historical precedent. So why then would Putin have a preference for Trump other than it's consistent with this harebrained, myopic, sort of liberal, reflexive, anti-Trump narrative that we've all been stuck in since 2016? It really makes no sense from Putin's standpoint. And so there's all kinds of hubbub and chaos and consternation around this latest comment from Putin. Maybe we can bring up on the screen uh, what Axios said here. So this is one of the headline encapsulations of it. Elon Musk said last night on Twitter, uh, Putin must not want Trump elected as though, you know, because Elon Musk is now a huge proponent of Donald Trump. He's basically kind of a full-time Russian PR person, sorry, not Russian. Elon Musk is kind of like a full-time Republican proponent. Um, So he's like spinning this latest news as somehow a point in Trump's favor and saying, oh, gee whiz, Putin must really like Kamala Harris. So let's all make sure we elect Trump. David Sachs, who is another um, fundraiser and proponent of Donald Trump, spoke at the Republican convention, said... Perhaps somewhat sarcastically, it's hard to tell. I asked him for some clarification on this score, but I didn't receive it. He said, today, all Americans should stand against Putin by rejecting his preferred candidate, the weak and ineffectual Kamala Harris. So my question there would be, okay, if the inference there is that Trump will be more tough and, quote, effectual against Russia than Kamala Harris would be, what are those measures that Trump would purportedly employ in a second term that would demonstrate that he's tougher on Russia and more, quote, effectual against Russia than Kamala Harris would be. Because we have a fairly lengthy record from Trump's first term that might give some insight into this. Let's just go briefly down the list for people who might be forgetful. Trump imposed massive sanctions on Russia. He started arming Ukraine. He expanded NATO. He still brags about it to this day. He expelled scores of Russian diplomats. He shuttered a Russian embassy. He tried to do regime change in Venezuela, which is Russia's chief client state in the Western Hemisphere. He uh, bombed and tried to cripple Syria with sanctions, which is another one of Russia's aligned governments in the Middle East. He tried to cripple Iran, which with sanctions, with which Russia is also increasingly aligned with and has forged heightened military and political ties with just in the past couple of years. Trump wants to escalate economic warfare with China, which Russia is also increasingly aligned with. Trump threatened to send nuclear submarines into the coastal waters off Russia to intimidate Russia into capitulating in Ukraine. That's true. That happened. Uh, Trump abrogated various arms control treaties with Russia. Trump expanded the U.S. military force deployments in Russia's periphery in Eastern Europe, which Putin and other top Russian officials have routinely complained about. And, you know, I could go on forever with this, but Trump has even said this year that he is strongly considering appointing Mike Pompeo, 
the former Secretary of State who ran U.S. foreign policy effectively under Trump's first term to yet another high-ranking national security job in a second term. So Russia might not view that especially favorably, and Putin gave voice to that sentiment perhaps. So everybody wants to do all this kind of crazy reverse psychology and assume that nothing Putin says can be taken at face value. And look, I'm not taking, I'm not necessarily in favor of taking anything that any world leader or politician says at face value. But this whole genre of commentary where you're always trying to divine ulterior motives in what Putin says and get inside his head and psychoanalyze him, that's one of the most garbage, tedious genres of commentary that I could personally think of. Maybe only second to the same kinds of psychobabble analyses of Donald Trump. So that should be probably discarded. And I think the best tool we have at our disposal right now is to just look at what Putin actually said, which is that he favors Kamala Harris and he doesn't have a preference for Trump. And that would align with the the actual record of the Trump administration, which I know is not fashionable to actually evaluate, but I'm beset with that fate, I guess. And I'm sharing it all with you. All right. So that's it. We're going to finish off with Democrats saying we are, uh, this is extremely dangerous for our democracy. Peace out. Stay free. Extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is 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 extremely dangerous to our democracy.